it's going to be a big chat. So I hope you have your notebook. I know Katie's, Katie's already in the room and we've had uh, some dialogue leading up to this and in terms of how to make this, uh, make this go. And I think it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And uh, so yeah, grab your notebooks. Make sure if you have any questions, uh, you know the drill. If you have any questions, just feel free to type into the chat box either directly to myself um, or, to, uh, or to the group. Uh, if you're more comfortable doing so on the mic, then you can unmute yourself and ask any questions you like within reason. Um, and general ground rules, uh, 7.47, so we'll get going. Uh, general ground rules for the evening and for every session. This is being recorded um, for all intents and purposes of saving the world one conversation at a time. We are uh, very much alive and well, as you all are. Very grateful to have everybody here. This is Let's Chat, an Athletic Therapy Roundtable. This is session nine, and we have uh, wow, a very intelligent, uh, a very exuberant and passionate guest uh, this evening. So I'll introduce uh, our guest, and we'll get rolling. Uh, Katie Mitchell is a PhD candidate in the Department of Kinesiology at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, her research is focused on the effects of postural control and exertion on visual perception across the athlete spectrum. She is a certified athletic therapist and registered physiotherapist specializing in concussion, vestibular, and orthopedic rehabilitation. Katie is currently the lead therapist for Sledge Team Ontario and has worked with high performance rugby and hockey for the past decade. Katie is, uh, like I mentioned, very passionate about what she does. I'm sure she could talk for hours and hours and hours, um, as we would all love to listen. We'll keep it to a relative timeline for the evening, uh, but we'll entertain uh, all dialogue as we keep this thing building. Again, lots of great feedback leading up to this session uh, in anticipation of Katie being here. Uh, I don't know Katie personally that well. We've had a couple discussions. She worked uh, alongside a good friend of mine um, and presented at the CATA conference. And that was an eye opener in terms of making like neuroscience relatable to somebody like me who doesn't have, uh, who doesn't have uh, that much of a background in terms of the research end, the academic end, but making it very understandable and very applicable for, uh, for the therapists in the room at that presentation. So Katie, without further ado, thank you very much much for your time this evening. Uh, I know you've got a course that you've loaded up. I've talked to a few people that are getting ready for your course starting, I think, this week or next week, but I uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, this evening. And just want to say hi to everybody, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Yeah, um, thanks so much for everybody uh, coming out and for that great introduction, James. Um, yeah, I am really excited to talk about this, and you're not wrong. I could probably talk about it for a very long time um, as I'm struggling to set up my course right now. So uh, I do see some familiar faces and uh, some people I, I'm yet to meet that are going to be in my course. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, thanks for everyone tuning in. Yeah, awesome. So um, I think we'll get right to the nitty gritty and get through like uh, the Netflix talk first. So are you watching? Are you watching Tiger King? Yes or no? I already completed that. I'm actually on the last dance now. If anyone else is what like so good. So good. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that brings us, that's a hard yes, and you've completed it. So that's, that's like, you have time to be uh, as academic and as studious as you are in this world and still be able to watch Tiger King to full completion. So that's five, four for yeses on Tiger King. And I think like anybody who needs to tune out now, go for it. And we're about to jump into some other stuff here really quickly. Um, and anything else you've been able to pick up? Uh, I've, I've just kind of follow your Instagram a little bit like that and see you working out. And I think it's your basement we talked about and uh, crushing some squats and set up a rack and just staying mobile and moving. And we know that's really good for everybody. But uh, what else have you been up to with this, this social distancing? Um, yeah, I've been up to a lot of things. Um, I have been working with uh, another clinician who specializes in kind of like business coaching and stuff. And so I kind of been preparing for something like this to allow me to make a big pivot. And uh, so some like COVID actually allowed me to leave a job that I was hoping to kind of quit anyways. <laughs> um, and uh, has given me the chance to actually start sit down and like create a course that I've been wanting to do. Um, and I'm also doing a bit of telehealth. Uh, so I am using um, an online platform to see some patients still. Um, definitely spending more time building the course, but um, I think more and more people are coming around to the telehealth. So yeah, I do in my basement. Um, I have like a squat scan and stuff. So 
I do some squats and deadlifts and things in my little cube. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, like, uh, we're lucky enough to have enough space to jump around a little bit here where we're staying right now, too. So it's been really good. And, and uh, I was talking to a really good friend of mine and future guest on this um, on this program as well. And we were just talking about, like, if there's one thing that you, you must advise every single person in a period like this, what would it be? I mean, outside of some obvious, like, breathe, um, movement, was, movement was key for brain health, for mental health, for, for overall well-being. So uh, I know we can, we can touch on that on any number of levels uh, throughout the course of this discussion, as we will. But, uh, um, yeah, so anything else, anything new that you've picked up in this time? Like, the business thing seems like a big undertaking for sure, but uh, anything new? Um, yeah, like basically everything I'm doing is new right now. So I've kind of, I'm not able to do any of the things I was doing. Um, I'm not able to do any of my research projects. Um, they were all person to person interactions. So I um, wasn't able to do any clinic. And I also obviously not going to sledge hockey nationals this year, um, had to cancel all those fights. So like everything, I'm doing everything new, but it's like all in the comforts of my home. So it's just kind of strange, but yeah. <laughs> yeah strangely good and strangely weird all at the same time yeah <laughs> yeah okay um well great so we'll jump into some informal stuff as we go but definitely on the on the formal side in terms of where we're going to take this dialogue just so everybody's aware we're going to touch in on um sort of the evolution of the consensus statement when it comes to concussion uh we'll look at baselining evaluative uh, uh evaluative evaluative tools for concussion in sports and the athlete um and some looking at some rehab we also want to take uh Katie, as an expert in the area of academia, as an athletic therapist, I know it's a bit of an intimidating area for some. Uh, it's also like, how do I make this work? So we'll definitely pick your brain. Good joke there uh, on, on that. And uh, an evidence-informed practice versus evidence-based practice. You and I sort of have a, the same view on that in terms of, you know, I'm not going to rely all on the science. I'm going to take a little bit of the art form and make it, I'll make informed decisions based on what's out there, but uh, I'm relating it to the clinical and field settings. So some really good stuff. And then obviously I want to dive into to your, your baby, the balance and motor control testing and training and, and like how some of us normies can just kind of can blend this into our uh, to our practices with athletes and things like that so um i have uh i'll just pull this up and share my screen first katie before you jump in but um the consensus statement uh i'll try and see if i can navigate my computer a little bit here just so everybody's aware i'm sure everybody's for the most part pretty aware of uh of that at this point in time um but i'll just have it uh, pulled up right here as soon as I share my screen, which is right there. So let me share my screen and let me share this one right here. So I think that's up there for everybody here. Um, and everybody can read, but I mean, uh, sport related concussions, a traumatic brain injury in, induced by biomechanical forces, several common features that may be utilized in clinically defining the nature of a concussive head injury include caused by direct blow to the head, face, neck, or elsewhere on the body. Um, sport related concuss concussion typically results in rapid onset of short lived impairment of neurological function. Uh, and that short lived component is where we're going to touch, touch on, uh, uh, I think a couple articles, one that you've written and, and certainly some others that you've researched that's becoming more and more of a, a longer lived, um, symptom. Um, and then obviously I'll let everybody else, you can kind of just read this, but this is a consensus statement from Berlin in, in 2016. Is that right? Cause that's the last time they, they updated it. Yeah. She yeah, she's it's supposed nice. to be this year was the next one, but it's been postponed to next year, so I'll have to wait. <laughs> right, so we'll we'll just rely heavily on on this one for now, um, and then you know going back in time, uh, I think. Um, let me just see what I can do here. Yeah, so concussion is like one. This was the the preamble in the article. It's just like one key unresolved issue, but. Um, this group obviously has come up with a definition that they're fairly happy with, but is being tweaked as we go through the consensus statement. Um, I just wanted to change gears just for a second, because I was listening to a couple podcasts today, um, completely unrelated to this topic, but yet tied in so nicely to what we're going to talk about. And, and uh, uh, it's content and context. And I think those are two, two key terms to understand. And again, like, because this is so, um, uh, fresh in my mind. I'm currently doing this Altus performance therapy course online. Um, and this is a direct quote from them. And that content is transient, 
entirely dependent on time and circumstance alone content tells us very little so in terms of science like we dive in all the time science but it tells us very little until we can apply it so if we understand the context in which that content exists we have a starting place from which we can accurately identify the problem and then the big statement in the middle i think is just something that to go by these days and and for life i think if you change the way you look at things the things you look at change so um you look under a microscope where you look from far away things look very different so it's the application and katie's an expert in this so i can't wait to jump in uh, on this and then the other thing um relevant to uh relevant to this chat uh, and connecting in this time is is this three lens ferocious buddha kaleidoscope which is david Meltzer. i don't know him I don't know Prince EA either, but Prince EA is a, he's a spoken word poet, he's a rapper, he's, he's a really, really intelligent guy. And, and they're talking about this three lens um, kaleidoscope of gratitude, productivity, and accessibility. And the bottom line is, is that, that we're all living for today, but we're learning for a lifetime. And I think that's a couple of key, key uh, messages that I just picked up on. Just, I, I was on Instagram, obviously, because that's what people do. And, uh, and these two were talking like on one of those Instagram lives. And I was just like, Oof. I was just taking notes. So I was like, we're talking with Katie tonight. These things are all really, really relevant to what we're trying to do with this platform. Um, and as a, as a human race, I think at this point in time. So, yeah. So, so if we can, can you sort of walk us through the, the evolution of the, um, the consensus statement? I know you have a firm understanding of what that is. So where we're, where we've come from, where we're at now and where it might be headed. Yeah, so um, if I think back to kind of when I started working in university sports, um, probably 13 or so years ago, um, even then, like we were still just kind of getting a grasp on what a concussion was. Um, we had stats in our kit, but I'll tell you, they were rarely used. <laughs> um, they were there for a reference, but to be honest, they weren't necessarily mandatory, let's call that. There was no protocol in place really for a management um, of a timeline or, you know, there was kind of this like arbitrary like week or two weeks. Um, they never really had an individual it was very cookie cutter that way. Um, and further, we didn't really understand um, the actual deficits that a concussion can result in. Um, of all the systems that it does uh, affect, we've kind of added those components through the years. And I think what originally like was just kind of like a, a little slip of paper has grown into like a five or six page document. So you can see that it's quite extensive now and even in that sense, it's still lacking quite a few things. So um, I think for me, like my career actually kind of sort of mirrors the evolution of the, the consensus um, and how I started asking questions and pursuing my own research. So um, it's kind of neat how that worked. Um, but I know when I originally started, I would ask questions to some of my, like I worked in university rugby and I would ask some guys, um, you know, they'd tell me things like they were having difficulty seeing on the field. They were having um, dizziness and stuff, and they couldn't really explain why. Um, and there was nothing really for me to test. I had no, like, options to show a coach, you know what, this is a problem. We need to keep this player off. So often I lost those battles because I didn't have the ammunition to defend that. Um, and that's one of the key things that I think for me um, that I decided to kind of pursue research was to be able to answer my questions because I was getting frustrated with not being able to find them. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so even when, if you refer back to the 2016 statement, that was the first time they added balance as its own clinical domain of concussion. And you think of what balance actually really means. People often think of the best and standing still um, or standing in tandem or standing on one foot, but there's a big, spectrum of from static to dynamic balance even um, and even kind of like the coordination and balance control requires during movements um, you know while you're in motion the ongoing kind of modulation of that um, we have a, like a vast system <laughs> of kind of endless possibilities there but we sort of put it in this little box and this is balance um, and we don't look at what other things it can be affect so uh, one of the studies out of my lab before i started my phd that kind of Got my interest was they did they put um, football players who had a recent concussion uh, in university football um, 
they, they did this as like a side thing. They just kind of were like, all right, we're going to put them on force plates, uh, you know, the beginning of the study and at the end and just have them stand still, eyes open, eyes closed. Um, yeah. And then compare them to some teammates. So this was just like a little side thing. This wasn't the main main uh, um, objective. And that study was actually mentioned in the 2016 consensus meeting as like one of the primary le like levels of evidence. It became this huge thing. So what they found was that when they tested athletes at uh, say phase two, which is what we consider being asymptomatic, where you know you maybe start an athlete riding a bike and doing really light aerobic stuff. Um, so they're asymptomatic, uh, recently concussed, um, stood on a force play, static, um, and then they repeated that testing again after they were cleared for return from their physician, the team physician. And what they found there was not a significant change between those two time points, and that when they compared them to the control athletes of those who hadn't had a recent concussion, they looked different. And it was something you could really only see at the level of um, using like something like a laboratory force plate uh, without using this objective kind of approach that we do as clinicians where we just view balance um, with the human eye. So you miss a ton of what's actually going on with the center of pressure between the feet. Um, and this was in like two foot stance. This wasn't even in uh, like, you know, single leg tandem what we make athletes do. This was just like the basic first <laughs> first level of the best and so for me I was like whoa this is mind-blowing like there's clearly something going on that we're the testing is just not rigorous enough um, and I think that's what um, when I was thinking about when you asked me about this question I think the evolution has been we started out and we're like kind of have no idea what this is so we're just going to kind of put these um, kind of arbitrary values and timelines on things and we're just going to rely on the physician to kind of make those decisions yeah um, and when research started to kind of bloom and sort of grow and it got really crazy there kind of in the early like kind of 2010s um that's when they were like okay we need to compartmentalize everything and do like all these domains and everything was tested in a single domain so you had you know your somatic physical symptoms you have your vestibular and ocular motor you've got um cognition and like sleep disturbances like so on and so on you guys have probably seen these before um however there's the problem is now is all of a sudden we're like okay we compartmentalized everything we gave it this timeline and now all of a sudden we're realizing that it's still not really working and something's missing and that players are getting hurt after they return to play even if it's not a concussion they're getting musculoskeletal injuries um, and they're all like, why is this happening? We're clearing them with our processes and things are just still, uh, still evidently there. Um, but we couldn't quite identify it. So they're making speculations now that, you know what, we're not actually determining readiness based on like what sport demands are. Um, we're doing kind of everything in like these little silos, like in seated and, um, you know, sport combines all of them together and it's messy and it's all of those demands at once so now everybody's like oh crap we need to reevaluate again and i was looking forward to this year's consensus um i had submitted uh some research to go towards it and i was looking at some really novel stuff and i we were basically combining kind of like vision science with um exercise and decision making and it was really really interesting what we'd found so far and so I think in a really long-winded question answer to the question uh that's how i see that evolution is sort of like we had no idea and then we put everything in this box and all of a sudden the box is blown open again so yeah yeah no I, I, a deeply rich answer and i don't think there is a i don't think there's a simple a simple way to answer it, but a couple things jump out in your response to me um one tying back to like that content and context idea um you know there's there's now all of this content and is trying to like sift through and contextualize like what's applicable, what's not, how can I make it um, you know, applicable, applicable to my situation or your situation or the athlete as a whole. So really, really good stuff. And I think even, uh, even for practitioners in a room that spend a lot of time, you know, when I was uh, still in the university setting, we were seeing somewhere like 60 plus uh, concussions diagnosed. Uh, reported uh, a, a, a year, you know, with um, with the varsity population. Some years more, some years definitely more. Um, but at the same time, I think this also opens the door for 
uh, evidence informed practice. Like we don't have to be, uh, we don't have to be an expert per se in concussion, but we can definitely be an expert in the field of sport related injury, apply some of that theory uh, and what's out there in the research to, to try some things like simple balance tests on force plates. Like the use of force plates is underutilized in, in the majority of rehab, right? Like they're not overly, um, they're not overly expensive, but they can be utilized in a balance test. They can be used in an ACL rehab. Like they're, they're sort of universal when you can do these kinds of things. Um, so you bring up some really good stuff and, and stop me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's a ton of science out there. There's definitely a ton of different compartments to concussion and rehab and baselining and all of these things. But again, it comes into like, how do we simplify this enough that we're putting our athletes at the center uh, and their best interest in terms of what we're doing? So from like a baseline and a rehab and an evaluative standpoint, you know, maybe we'll jump in and see like what you would advise on like a, um, a best case scenario for each one of those. But some really good stuff and some really deep stuff. And I think like the more we know, the less we know. Right. Is that fair? Exactly. That's how I feel every single day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm not alone. Uh, when I miss uh, 140 new articles that have come out, I'm, I'm not alone in thinking I'll never catch up, but I'm, I'm kind of caught up, I guess, to some degree. Um, appreciate the answer. And the honesty is, 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 uh, is amazing because I think some of us get completely overwhelmed when it comes to, um, you know, certain rehab scenarios. Like, like I just remember being a student or having students and it was always like low back. Nobody wanted to evaluate a low back, but like 87% of the population has low back pain so like what are you worried about they're going to be okay you're going to be okay it's just a matter of like figuring out what parts you can use what parts you can't and, and how to not make it worse so um really good stuff can, can we uh pivot and go that way are you okay talking a little bit about sort of like a, what does a baseline look like for you if you're baselining athletes now on non-concussed beginning of the season um how does that look to you right now um, so I think going back to that quote you had about context, um, and really like, you know, if you follow the content, you're going to lose the individual and the, like the actual context. And, um, I, I was in this journal club last week with, uh, it was run by a neurologist in the States and there was some like neurosurgeons on it and people who you would say are like really medical people. And it was really funny when they said, we over-medicalize everybody. <laughs> like, oh, especially with the concussion, we were like, okay, you need to see X, Y, and Z. We're going to get you this appointment, this appointment, this appointment. And all of a sudden they're going, oh my gosh, like I have all this stuff going on. Um, so when I baseline, like I don't actually like, <laughs> I, and I work with a, like a sled talking program. So it's, it's a very different world when you think of career sport and the different kind of, um, adaptive type of things I have to do with them. Right. Um, I would say, honestly, like I'm not a huge believer in baseline testing. I know that associations, organizations, it's a liability, they want it done. Um, and I think when the, when the last consensus came out and they said that they didn't require it, um, that for me was like, okay, we can kind of slow down this like boom of concussion baseline testing that's happened that is not, uh, not necessary. Um, I think the best thing that you can do is get a really good history. And so um, when I say good history, I mean like, who is that individual? What have they experienced? Um, what is a common, um, you know, what's, what is it's in a month's time? Like, do they have things like headaches or migraine? Have they ever had a previous concussion in general? You just want to want to know what their, um, their uh, status is that way because you know if they've been playing a high contact sport for a long enough time even if they haven't had a concussion they've probably acquired enough force to have some kind of like vestibular ocular issues um i was just looking at a study that actually just they just tested a whole bunch of football players um using some basic vestibular maneuvers and about 25 percent of them were positive without any symptoms of vertigo daily or anything that affected their performance. And it was to do with potentially just, you know, the forces that they take um, could actually cause that. So regardless if they've had a concussion, I want to know kind of what their history is. Um, so when I give my medical forms though, for example, they're quite long and they're mostly just, I want to know what kind of medications you're on or what the things you take. Um, I want to know history of mental health, um, learning disabilities, all those things. 
because what happens in a lot of cases is the impairments that you get from a concussion tend to exacerbate other things. Um, and they're not necessarily things that are in our wheelhouse, but we can identify them and screen them because we tend to be, as therapists, be like confident for an athlete. Um, even just in the study that I'm doing, I've had some athletes come in my door and I get talking to them and they're just like, yeah, like, you know, I, ever since my injury, I get super anxious when I have to do presentations at school. And it's like, they just weren't confident because when they were acutely concussed, they had headaches and issues and they just did a bad presentation. And then since then, it just butterflied into this, you know, anxiety, like fear avoidance thing that they were thinking was like post concussion. But no, it was just something that developed after. And so I think, like I said, get a really good picture of who you're looking at. And if you're with that team uh, weekly, you will know when changes start to happen or if something starts to look kind of funny to you. Um, I think that, you know, if you do a best as a baseline, that for me is, is meaningless. It won't, it won't tell me next week what that person is going to look like. It's going to change. So um, I would say on top of a history, I would probably do um, like a, a VOMS or something as well, just to, again, see what kind of like symptom provocation there is with that athlete. Because um, you don't know even if they don't realize that they experience those things that post-concussion, they could present them. And then it's like, oh no, they've got a positive VOMS. But really, they could have had motion sensitivity and, you know, like poor saccades or something beforehand. Um, I've done enough of those tests on healthy athletes to know that everybody acts a little like performs differently on those so um yeah i think getting a good handle on some of those things so that you know what the other end of it looks like when they do have a concussion um that will best serve you i guess in those findings yeah yeah i think um again like this is uh, just the common threads that we've talked about with everybody and the guests that we've had on is like knowing the human that's in front of you makes a huge difference regardless of if they're hurt or not. You know, it allows you to feel like um, as a practitioner or as a sideline therapist that, that you're there and, and you understand them a little bit more. They see you as caring. They uh, understand the commitment and getting to know them and them getting to know you and starting to build that trust. So concussion or not, um, I think to a person, everybody on here has said, you know, the person in front of you becomes crucial as opposed to what tests you're doing, you know, and, uh, and that's, that's really good stuff. Um, and, and one thing you blew my mind actually when we were talking the other day, cause I've always kind of had this simplistic view in my mind, just because that's the kind of mind that I have, I think is just very simple, um, has been like concussion is, yeah, it's big and it can be overwhelming, but, um, why do we jump all of a sudden with a head injury or brain injury um, to, uh, to not do something similar like an ankle sprain, right? Like we, we, we try to do our best not to uh, exacerbate symptoms and then we try our best to kind of coach it back. But we also know like we need tissue and I'm not saying ankle tissue is the same as brain tissue by any means, but we also know that uh, we need exposure and then we need recovery. We need exposure, we need recovery and we need to press uh, when it's warranted. And again, this is the, the context side of things and like the artsy side of what we do, but like we need to push the threshold, but not through the threshold. And that becomes very much an art form, right? And so um, when you said something similar to those lines of like, it doesn't have to be treated that, I mean, context again, but like doesn't have to be um, treated differently than an ankle sprain in terms of like the outlook and how you're going to approach it. Um, I was just like, wow, this is, this is amazing that, that you with as much depth and research and things like that. Um, so I think, I think um, taking away some of those levels of over sciencing things and making it a little bit more um, accessible for practitioners um, takes away some of that anxiety as a, as a practitioner who's trying to help people. Um, and then again, like you bring up vestibular ocular testing with athletes as a baseline and, and just sort of like some balance stuff. And it, it's, it's amazing to see athletes try to do tests first of all, like virtually any test. So you've seen some athletes that throw a baseball 100 miles an hour and they push off of one leg, but you ask them to, to walk backwards and they can't do it, you know? So sometimes that specialization of sport, that plays a role in sort of like where their balance is at or how their motor, motor patterning happens or like their learnability or whatever the things are with the tasks. So um, yeah, re really good stuff. And, and sort of like um, from a baseline standpoint, I think pretty much standard across the board was always best, right? The best test, the balance exertion, 
test uh, flat ground and then on, a, on an uneven surface, um, the SCAT, whatever number it's at now, 78, um, with the extra two questions a year kind of thing, um, not to minimize it, I think there's some value in it too. Uh, some form of neurocognitive testing, like an impact test or something like that, where they're online doing some testing, um, and then the the sort of some of the recent ones have said like let's look a little bit further at like bombs and the VOR right so um, if you're working with athletes again questioning questioning uh, a little bit more depth right like like more adding to the history I guess is, is there's some value there would you agree with that Yeah and I think um, I think the like even the neurocognitive testing and things you touched on there like it's not really our wheelhouse either. So when I like when people are ministering the impact and stuff, I wonder like, do you ever look at it again? Like really, what what are you using that for? Um, you know, that's neuropsych. <laughs> so uh, I find that one to be like, you know, especially like private practices who use it and stuff. It's just like, I don't I don't understand where that comes from anymore. But I think that's gonna change a little bit too. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think the evidence now, and especially and I'm biased because I like the sensory systems and integration and stuff. But there's more and more evidence coming out, like the article I shared with you, um, yeah. and even some stuff I've dug up just recently. Like even in like 2020, so far has just published so many things. Uh, but there's more and more associating now, like they're seeing the the long term. Uh, I guess the uh, quality of the bombs as an assessment. So looking at the acute scores on the bombs as a predictor of recovery. Um, that one came out of like really big researcher um, out of Pittsburgh, who's like the queen of vestibular. Uh, she published that. So like when I see her name on it, I'm like, okay, this is, and it's like the CARE Consortium too, which is, if you guys don't know, has been like a multi-center, multi-year study with the NCAA. Um, so that one just came out and it's, I think it's been like, I don't even remember the, the range of years when I first looked at it uh, a couple of days ago, but um, we're now starting to see like those vestibular ocular kind of impairments at the beginning are better predictors than say looking at the best, for example. Um, so like I said, I don't, I don't like the best as much. I, I don't mean to slam it, but it is a good test for when you're kind of stuck with um, little resources, but it's really hard to justify to a parent or another stakeholder uh, the difference between like a four and a six on the best so yeah <laughs> I find that one to be just uh, most ridiculous to try and explain so yeah um, yeah and 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 anybody who who um is looking for something to read basically anything out of upmc like the university of pittsburgh medical center um and they're very accessible so when we were working at the university um cindy hughes was the head therapist at the time in the clinic and and she i think quite literally just picked up the phone called down we went down and shadowed um dr collins and went through the upmc and their concussion protocol like very very accessible people um and and i was supposed there. to be there this weekend actually uh, yeah and just like a great facility and, and but these these are the conversations that we had when we were there too is like you know uh, what's too much and what's too little and and it's very much like navigating that to see what's going to work in, in your clientele and they do a lot of like uh nfl um uh, uh, army and navy veterans and, and yeah. you know, those people at upmc and and uh all the research that comes out of there so um do you have uh do, do, do you want to just for people who might not be familiar bombs and bor do you just want to walk us through like a, a brief overview of what those are sure so um the bombs and sorry if i throw terminology around some people need to reel me in um is a vestibular ocular motor screen and so it's a very basic assessment it's similar to what we've used in the past to just do our cranial nerve assessment so if you guys have ever done like your a chest that's your smooth pursuits at the very start it's the easiest one um and then you do some saccades which are quick eye movements so um that's just like save your two targets um and you have to look back and forth as quickly as you can um, you do that in vertical and horizontal and then uh so then there's also near point convergence which is um like non-conjugate eye movement where the eyes actually go in the opposite direction so it's like when you go cross-eyed um so it's seeing how close you can bring target towards your face without it going either double or blurry um and that's a direct like that's looking more so even at the, the midbrain and stuff function as well um and then so the bor the vestibular ocular reflex is our day stability and so people in here are going to do my course we'll talk a lot about the bor um so 
essentially when we walk, our head oscillates. And if you think of as you're walking down the sidewalk or you're walking your dog, your horizon isn't like oscillating in the distance, right? So when our head moves, our vestibular system sends a signal to our brain stem and to the um, vestibular nuclei, and that projects onto our oculomotor nuclei, creating a reflex of our opposite. Uh, so it's like an equal and opposite eye movement in uh, response to the head movement. So we have a stable horizon because our eyes move in the opposite direction of our head all the time. So if you can think of if that was even slightly off, <laughs> how debilitating that could be for somebody. And what I want to put into perspective is just walking. So like walking your normal pace is about like a two hertz oscillation. And that's about 120 beats per minute if you had a metronome. So if you think of just walking as being that demanding, and I, I think at the Cata conference, uh, when I was there, I had people try like 120, I think it's just a, like doing head turns back and forth. And a lot of people had to sit down, like that was their threshold. Um, and obviously that's a bigger amplitude of movement, but an athlete should be like 150 plus. Um, there's a lot of, there's, really, there, sorry to interrupt you, but there's a lot of alcohol probably involved with that scene. <laughs> Or maybe it was the hangovers because it was during the day. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can imagine the amount of oscillation that happens in running or pivoting and turning, like maybe changing levels. Um, there's a lot of demand there. And I think we miss the mark in not incorporating stuff like that into our rehab. Um, and that's kind of what I speak to in my course a little bit is how to like, okay, we know how to do this um, you know, screen, but how do we apply it to actual rehab? Um, so we have to be able to meet the demands of sport um, before we can clear somebody. Because even just doing it seated, you're still not meeting the demands. And so that's kind of what we do now with my research is we play around with, okay, well, let's put them on a treadmill and do this stuff. Um, let's, you know, have another task while they're doing it. So you kind of can see how we're blending and breaking down the silos a little bit. Um, yeah, that, the VOR is uh, commonly seen as a deficit or dysfunction where it induces a lot of dizziness. Um, people feel sick. Uh, a lot of the time we start people in seated and then progress into standing, walking, et cetera, with head turns. Um, even just think of just going in a grocery aisle, like an athlete's daily routine, like they have to be able to like walk around to campus, for example, and they look here, they look there, and they're walking, right? So that's a really common thing, but we, for some reason, put people in a chair and do these assessments. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what, that, um, what I mean by when you do a baseline, you should have an idea of what the tolerance is for those kinds of the tasks. Because like you said, when you're saying you make a uh, player run backwards and all of a sudden they're like totally uncoordinated, um, it can be really specific to the activity or sport they do. So if you get them to do something that's out of context, <laughs> they're going to look really impaired. <laughs> right. But if you get them in context, um, to like when we talked about action capabilities, um, they're going to be a little more in tune with what they're doing because that's what they're trained to do. Yeah, yeah. And I think like a, a great insight just in terms of like talking about, you know, the oscillations that happen in really basic things. And you have those, uh, we all have athletes or, or clients or patients or parents or uncles or whoever that come in the room concussed or having an issue, ankle, knee, head, and they come in the room and say like, I, I didn't do anything all day. And, and I got all these symptoms. And really, like, there's no doing nothing like this whole black room and like turn out the lights and do nothing that can't happen uh for most people and it's not advisable either in most cases but um even just that simple uh moving around through the course of the day and then as we move along through to to like the rehab end of things um what what i typically do when it's like return to play is is like why is it concussion specific at this point when we get to return to play like i can take virtually any um return to play protocol put an athlete through that and that's going to incorporate multi-systems right like if i'm going to do an acl protocol and i'm going to clear an athlete to to be um uh, on the field either participating in practice or play i'll put them through a rigorous test to ensure that they're up to speed on a lot of different levels and i think we don't have to say like okay do the concussion return to play protocol uh, once it gets to on field then it becomes task specific but um, chunking that down into smaller manageable sizes and seeing if people are symptomatic or what 
portions of that bring it on i think makes a lot of sense too um yeah so how, how about um from an evaluative standpoint in concussion like symptoms are a big thing right like we're not taught to necessarily when we treat uh chase symptoms except when it comes to concussion we really have to follow um we have to follow the and again it comes back to your history and, and what you talked about earlier but we really do have to to take what's being said by the patient and sort of follow that and track that in terms of like today was a, a whatever a really really bad day on these levels of physical pain or or vestibular stuff so how do you go about um in terms of evaluation um or ongoing evaluation what, what would you recommend just from like a really simplistic outlook that might work um again i'm probably going to go against like what a lot of <laughs> i think and and i i think i stand with a lot of the practitioners and stuff who are in line with research is you i said it before we over medicalize a little bit and the problem with asking a person every single time they come in your door, you have one of these 20 something symptoms, they're gonna say yes. And then you're gonna be like, okay, we're tracking your symptoms. But guess what? Those could be just symptoms of like, okay, their concussion is probably healed, but now they're in this state of my life has changed, my job has changed, I'm not able to do my sport, I'm not able to do all these things. Those, like, there's so much overlap with symptoms that I have, I struggle with it a little bit. Um, if anything, I talk about, okay, like, how did your week go? Like, I tend to ask questions about their lifestyle and how, what they actually accomplished. And you just like, oh, I had a headache this day and this day. And it's like, okay, like, if, if there's so much period of time, though, I'm going to stop rating it as a severity score um, and evaluating it more on the subjective. Uh, because, again, too, there, there's even research that says, like, the perspective of pre-injury become skewed a little bit and so they think that they were like this you know crystal clear like symptom free person before their injury but maybe they did i personally i have migraines frequently so like i know that if i had a concussion i'd probably be this like crazy migrainer um so there's gonna be this disconnect of what they thought before of what they were this perfectly healthy person without these symptoms no anxiety nothing um because a lot of the symptoms are things that, like I said, can overlap with other uh, conditions. And I'm, I'm going through a, an evaluation of the symptoms right now with another AT colleague. So uh, it's interesting to see that we might be changing the wording or changing the way we evaluate symptoms in general with uh, potentially the next consensus or after that, I guess. Yeah, this is so this is so rich hearing this from you. Like this is amazing to hear somebody who's so like academically endowed and, and a great practitioner too. Don't get me wrong. Like like um, Katie is also a practitioner. She's not strictly a, an academic. Like we'll talk about this uh, this blend of things as well. But sort of I, I don't know the number of times that I've talked to athletes uh, concussed or otherwise, right? Um, that they constantly strive to reach normal again. Like I want to be normal again. And this this very like social distancing period of COVID-19 is very much like, oh, I want to get back to normal. Well, if you go back to normal now, go back to what was normal before, it's not going to be a good outcome. But secondary to that is like, what is normal? Like, what is normal? Once you get three months out from a concussion or three months out from a, an ACL rehab, like, do you even have a firm grasp of what normal was prior to anymore? And you, you start to search for uh, this feeling or this sensation of like, of what you feel you should be. And I think that these are huge points, right? That don't get talked about in the research so much in the sciencey side of things, um, but definitely in the therapeutic and like the clinical and the application side. So this is, these are like really, really valuable conversations to have, to hear, and to, you know, refute if you don't agree with it. Um, but from, a, from an anecdotal standpoint, the number of times I've said like to athletes, what is normal? Like, what is it that you're searching to get back to? And if you can't identify that, then let's try and throw normal out and let's go with how you're doing right now and move forward, right? Like, let's try and try and move on from that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you brought up a great point too. When we were at UPMC, and this is years ago, um, a few years ago anyway, um, they said the same thing. It's like at some point in the concussion uh, uh, rehab or the prolonged symptoms, we throw the word concussion out. 
when we're no longer applying all of these symptoms to concussion, right? We move into the neuropsych, we move into the experts in the, in the, the, the vestibular ocular stuff and, and compartmentalize and start to say like, okay, let's throw away the word concussion. You're not concussed anymore. You have a systems injury and we're just trying to navigate which system we need to, you know, not necessarily manipulate, but, but deal with um, maybe more um, accurately than before. Yeah, and you you say like there is actually research coming out that is evaluating this, like the subjective evaluation of someone's symptoms and actually how they perform. Um, the article we reviewed in this journal club last week, and this is where I was seeing all these surgeons talking about you know the personal side of things, and it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> um, but it was an article talking about cognitive performance and then cognitive symptoms. And the fact that they weren't always related to each other, like someone could be perceiving themselves to be much worse, but they're still performing fine on their cognitive testing. Mm -hmm. So there is something there that um, is potentially now the way they, like again, perception and the, the more the psyche rather than, um, and the, the psychosocial stuff is, is partly sometimes our fault of what we implant in the person when we're evaluating them. We have to be really careful with the language we use. Yep. Um, I do have a patient or two that like did have traumatic injuries that ended up with ophthalmology and things coming back positive and that there was an actual impairment there. And I told her like, this is no longer a concussion. You have like a neuro ophthalmol, like a, a, an actual like tangible thing to say that you have an injury um, where literally your eyes don't work together. So this is no longer the, what we originally called a concussion. This is, this is now we are categorizing this differently. Um, and that's not every person. Most people will recover within this certain amount of time. But there is something, again, that we've looked at where there's things that are lingering beyond what we call clinical recovery. Um, so beyond even, so I don't rely on symptoms again because most of my research is based on an asymptomatic group. <laughs> So I can find things that differentiate groups based on recovery, but their symptoms are gone. And that's what we rely on so much. We don't use enough objective testing or rigorous testing to be able to say that there is something still existing when symptoms are then gone. Yep. And the necessary person won't perceive it either, but when you really challenge them and compare them to their counterparts or themselves, there's still something that's a little bit not quite like the same. And a lot of it comes down to what we're seeing now is the visual piece and um, that sort of perception action coupling things and I've talked about a bit. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, uh, we'll pivot over there here in a second. But um, yeah, and I don't mean to minimize like concussion. It's a very real thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's obvious with the amount of time, money and effort that's going in in terms of the science and these kinds of things. I'm, I'm not saying that concussions don't exist. I'm not saying that persistent symptoms are not associated with concussion, but I think there's definitely an area of, you know, turning off that line of, of holding on to everything being concussion. And, and we're getting a whole lot better with some of the content. Content, right like that content is so rich that we can now put it into context of those systems so it's not like content and context don't come together it's just a matter of how far uh, how 50 50 it is when it comes to sort of like yeah content and context so re really good stuff um, Michael asked a question do you think the new protocol or baseline testing might benefit from dual task activities I think we've hammered on that I think dual task is dual task try task like if you're gonna baseline somebody see, know your athlete first know your patient first like there's not too many people that don't dual or multitask now with virtually everything we're doing I mean I'm taking notes I'm listening I'm uh, I'm speaking like all kinds of things like just sitting still is not even one thing anymore it's not a single singular task and it doesn't take one singular system so good question um, and I think everybody will benefit from uh, as a practitioner as well have your athletes or patients do things that they would normally do as a baseline and, and just get to know them um, whether that's like a biomechanical assessment a, a range of motion simple range of motion test at the beginning of the year look at the neck look at the eyes look at because we, we've caught a number of athletes just by looking like let's just do some simple like gaze work when you sit down at the table and like number of athletes we've caught with ocular things that they didn't even know existed or were just a and then and then, and then in turn you go down the path of the history and you find um, either behavioral things or academic issues or all of these other things that, that just have never been diagnosed so you uncover a lot of things by getting to know athletes on a uh, on a, on a 
baseline. So anyway, um, really, really good stuff. And, and we could probably talk on that for however long we needed to, but uh, we're kind of approaching like an hour and we haven't even dove into it. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'll just post this one. Let me just share my screen one more time just so everybody has, uh, has that. This is, I guess, your recent, um, your recent article here uh i'll just pull it up and the titles there and everything and this will be again this will be up in the youtube in the in the discussion section uh, balance control and youth hockey players with and without a history of concussions during a lower limb reaching task so these are your dual task things and you're looking at specific systems and, and i'll let you walk everybody through um through that briefly um but before we dive into that article maybe um we talked about this evidence informed approach and, and how uh, there's a lot of room for athletic therapists to, to be doing academic stuff that isn't necessarily overwhelming. I'm one of those. I was never an academic. I always thought, you know, I'm pretty good at, at working with people. I'm pretty good at rehabbing, so I'll be okay. But uh, as time went on, I really bought into to that evidence informed and, and live it uh, as best I can now. Completed a master's with some really basic data at, at the university that I was at before. And, um, but maybe you can talk on that definitely in terms of how you've blended the academic side and I know you're a clinician so um, take the reins on that one that'd be awesome to hear your your angle yeah um, I get asked this question at least like three times a year by a clinician um, who's just like how did like how does this work for you to do this um, and it, it's valuable because I did the same thing I reached out to like a handful of people, some I didn't even know. I just like emailed them um, and said, okay, you're doing a PhD, but you're also a practitioner. How does that, how does that work? Um, you know, how do you handle like a change in income to do that? Because I, I definitely was one of those people where I was always like knee deep in sports and did not think I was gonna be a researcher at all. I didn't do any research in my undergrad. Um, I was always like, when I really look about, like think back though, like I was always involved in something where like, I was reading stuff or like really keeping up to date with everything. I always had this really keen interest in neuroscience. And when I went to AD school, again, like had no interest in being a researcher at all, but I, I do remember having conversations with, uh, I went to Mount Royal and so I, I, I talked to some faculty there and I just like, you know, I want to do more in neuroscience. And that was what um, led me into PT school is to just dive deeper into that. And, um, and so I, it wasn't until the end of the PT school when I started to work with neural patients and I'm talking like, you know, acute strokes and things like that where I was like, whoa, this stuff is so cool. Um, but I realized I had all these questions and things that started to brew up. And this was again, evolving with the concussion re research that was going on as well. Like all of a sudden things started to pop up where I was like, whoa, that is really neat. I want to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I was done my master's, someone asked, like a faculty at Queens asked me to do, um, asked me if I wanted to do a PhD and I was like, no way. <laughs> I am like seven years into school. I just want to like go work and I want to do something. And I've never been someone who could just put my head down and do one job. <laughs> so yeah. I, I ended up uh, within a year and a half of working full time uh, in a private practice. I just got like bored. Kind of. I, I was always working sports till I worked uh, in the field. Um, and I always worked events and things, but I just, there was something else I had to do. Like I just felt uh, the need to go, go back. And I had a really steep learning curve. Like I'm probably one of the people who, you know, some people go in and they're like, I did a little bit of research somewhere along the lines. And I didn't really have that. And so I had to learn everything um, from the get-go. And I just had a conversation with someone this week who's a physio and she'd done her master's actually in my lab and wants to now come back because she's like, I'm seeing everything that you're doing and I want to come back and do it, like carry on with it. And uh, so um, for her, it's like, she's got at least a master's to kind of build off and like yourself, like if you went in and did a PhD, you'd at least kind of have, you know, once you got in the door. Um, but I kind of had, you know, I hadn't done statistics in like eight years when I started my PhD. So it was just like, I was taking it all over again. Um, and so I did, I would say it is a marathon. Um, but it, if I, like, and you say I'm this brilliant human and an expert, but I really don't see myself that way yet. Um, I think that if I can pull it off, then most people at this level, if you've come this far in academia, like there's nothing stopping you from going further into research if you want to. If you're passionate about a question, you learn how to do all the strategies, you've already come this far learning everything that you've already done. Um, and we've 
become masters of time management as therapists. I got to say like, you know, in AT school, it was like a 12 hour like calendar that was full every single day, including weekends. Like, and it prepares you for things. Like I was able to kind of schedule in my clinic time was, you know, it was part time, but I did manage to work like 15 hours a week. Plus, you know, I slide in some field on the weekends and I still do. Uh, I do it once a month now though on a weekend. So it's a little more uh, practical, but uh, I, I still was working um, two nights and no, sorry, a night and a, like a morning in clinic. I kind of reduced my hours just for, I was doing data collection. And so I have just a lot of athletes and things coming in in the evenings. So it was tricky to um, have two evenings of work. And I was also teaching. So um, I found that I was still managing all of that and still getting like kind of two five hour clinic shifts a week. Um, and like, for me, it's really important to keep that full circle uh, I didn't want to just like switch, you know, flip the coin and just go into academia. I wanted to be able to bridge the two and be able to do like take things that I learned and concepts and be able to educate my patients and clients and be able to apply some of the things that I was doing in clinic. And so that for me was um, really helpful. And I would say like most of my patients would say it was incredibly beneficial just from an education standpoint. Yeah, yeah, like huge. And, and, and for me, it was always intimidating to like, I'm uh, getting older now, I've been a practitioner, <laughs> like uh, academia is kind of like the young person's game. And, but at the same time, like I was, <laughs> as, as I started having conversations with some of the supervisors and potential like, uh, um, yeah, supervisory panels at, at York when I was there, uh, like the experience was, was very much um wanted from their end like you have so much clinical and field experience let's try and draw from that the academic side doesn't have to be overwhelming you have a ton that we can pull from and really blend it and make that marriage like you talked about make it really work and so um this is it and simply like data collection is is uh anybody's game at this point like if you're with teams you're in a clinic you're doing these kinds of things just start looking at little trends and little things like that and if you find something that really interests you or a demographic that really interests you um dive in and just but just start small like i was talking to um to one of uh, uh the strength coaches uh that was on the other night and i was just talking to him for about an hour and he's like what should i do my thesis on? i was like well why are you asking me like what interests you you know and 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 as we got going with it it was very much like there's a ton of stuff you can do, but you don't, you also don't have to like split the atom with your research, see what you see, and then take a, take a chunk that you can bite off and, and digest. Don't, don't try to make like this whole big thing of it. Um, use something that's going to be functional in your work and that you're going to be passionate about and that, and that you do on a regular basis. You can collect data that way. So um, and, and you've gone uh, way above and beyond in terms of publications and articles and things like that. And uh, um, it's amazing to see. And I'm just here, I'm just sharing this as a, an excerpt from your latest paper because we'll dive into that a little bit too. Um, there's the, uh, yeah, so it's just highlighted and underlined the, the increasing evidence suggesting that neurophysiological deficits affecting balance control can persist beyond clinical recovery um, that may not be detected through subjective observation. So this is in the literature, um, not just yours, but um, a lot of literature out there, it's sort of um, highlighting the fact that, yeah, dual task and, and multi-systems and looking at this thing from a, from a different angle, like that statement is, is probably true if we took away the neurophysiological and we said about uh, an ankle sprain, right? Like we would say evidence suggests that physiological deficits affecting balance control can persist beyond clinical recovery. Like we'll clear somebody to go back to football and they'll still be persistent uh, deficits in, in other areas. Again, not to minimize concussion, but just uh, like to, to say that this is this is true with concussion is that that's a, that's a big thing to understand as a as a new student as a, sorry a new new therapist a new trainer somebody who's been in the field for a long time who hasn't spent a lot of time with either the research or with concussed patients like uh that's that's massive so i i know that you're um you want to just talk on your paper a little bit and, and it was fairly recent it's been published congratulations um but yeah just talk to your paper and how that came about maybe some of the results and and, and the methodology that you used to, to come up with it yeah, so um, thank you for putting out that little excerpt. That was nice. Um, actually, that study was, I think we started it like four years ago, um, but it actually got published was quite a bit later. Uh, I've got like a couple of other publications that are just, and obviously COVID kind of 
out in the way, but um, things are in the works to be also being published, which was another kind of, it's the same paradigm as this study. So there's a lot more uh, evidence that I can speak to from this paper. Um, but it's kind of funny. This is like, we walked into a hockey academy. Um, we had a set of fit lights. So if you guys don't know what fit lights are, um, a company in Aurora uh, created them. They're like these little pods um, that you can, like they're sensor based or uh, you can touch them and like they turn off, like they light up and then you can turn them off. Um, so I always call this paradigm, like refer to it as a dance dance revolution type paradigm. Right. Um, and so I think I presented this, I want to say I presented something very similar to this at the CETA conference in like 2017, um, with probably one of the varsity studies that is waiting to get published as well. So um, we basically, and we, we didn't go in looking for concussions. We just, we, there was like 40 kids at this academy. Um, they were all training like the same level basically uh, throughout there, basically from grade eight to grade 12. And they were all trying to get into like, you know, the OHL or, you know, AAA kind of stuff that was, they were very uh, highly trained. So on the ice almost every day in the gym, at least four times a week. Um, and so we thought, okay, this is like a population that's like in this little, kind of like its own little isolated space um, that we can use. So when we went in, we were just looking to do like a normative test with um, the spit light system and a, and a Nintendo Wii board. Um, so unfortunately, they're not manufacturing Wii boards anymore, but we were able to outfit it to be a force plate. And so it collects the force under the feet, essentially, so we can calculate the center of pressure. Um, so we had them stand in, a, in the center of the Wii board on one foot. And so there was like an arc in front of them of five lights. Uh, and they were, there was a red light, green light task. So um, I'm going to use my hands because I can't really use my feet. But they're standing on one foot. And when the lights turned green, they had to hover their foot over and reach out to turn off the light um, and then come back to the board and so there was oh i want to say like 30 lights that went off so this was like a 50 second pass like they were in single leg stance for at least 50 seconds reaching out to these lights and they were only instructed to go after the green so if it was red they had to inhibit themselves but they were told to go as quickly as they could without losing their balance right and so you tell kids to do this they're gonna be like ah, like going for it um, so you don't have any of them were like falling off and we're like, okay, you guys will do it again. You can't fall off the board all the time. Um, so they're really like trying to do it. And so we also use the VOMS. Um, and I think I mentioned in the paper we use it, but I didn't include the results. I don't think on it or I, I forget the editors didn't like it in the paper. So we don't want to put it in. Um, but throughout, we tested them over 70 days. So it was uh, November and then back again in February. Mm -hmm. We wanted to look at okay, does it like a dual task like this? So it's a decision making task and a balance task all at the same time. Um, so we wanted to see okay, is this is this going to be uh, resistant to learning effects? Are they going to be able to learn this task and get better at it because they've done it more than one time? Um, and then as we went through, the other variable was we discovered that a number of them have had concussions in the last. Uh, it was like last three years I think it was um, and a lot of them were within the last year uh, but we didn't we kind of kept it so that there was at least I want to say six months or something um, between like with their last concussion so if they were it was within six months we didn't include them um, and there was a couple of them that I actually diagnosed on site so there was one or two like you know like 12 year old kids who say you know what I actually got hit on the weekend I haven't felt good since um, and they did their bombs and they were so dizzy and I didn't even finish um, but they weren't feeling so bad that you really could, they wanted to still do the task. And so we included them, but in this study, we had to take them out of the analysis. So um, what was really interesting is when we had, say, an acutely concussed person within like a week of their concussion do the task, they were severely impaired on the task compared to their counterparts. Um, and then when we retested them 70 days later, they were much better. Um, obviously, I would have liked to be able to test them throughout to see it happen, but uh, they did a couple of the kids did seek out like physio or athletic therapy, something where they achieved a little bit of rehab there. Um, but it wasn't necessarily to the point where they were like spectacular at it. They were just better than their uh, acute injury. And you would expect that, right? Like when you're not feeling good to have a headache, you just wouldn't do good at that task. Um, but what the big interesting finding was when we categorized kids into previously concussed um, and then having no history of concussion, when they did the task and we analyzed that center of pressure data, they had different strategies in how they did it. So they kind of looked the same, you know, they all did the reaching task, 
uh, but the kids who reported previous pink patch in, they were like, we call, it was more conservative. So when we break down the signal, we can look at things in a different way. And so we can kind of look at how they're able to like harness their center of pressure as they're moving. Okay. And so this is going to sound like a lot of crazy talk, but essentially they were, it showed there's a visual motor impairment of some sort where they weren't as reactive. It was, um, they weren't, sorry, anticipatory is a better word to say. So you would think an athlete who is like anticipating those red lights or the green lights, that they would just be going for them in a right. much more quick kind of like more um like a less uh I'm running out of words on this thing james yeah um, yeah like a, like a direct manner <laughs> i think they would be able to yeah like they were they had less uh like they were it's almost like less controlled because they were just kind of going for it you think of that athlete that just like kamikaze goes for it they're not sitting there thinking about okay how am i going to do this um so it was that anticipatory uh, control that the other kids were lacking. And so they were more conservative, that they were almost like harnessed, like they were just slower in that sense. And so we couldn't really attribute it to much because it was just from balance that we were looking at. So obviously we didn't collect um, anything of like gaze behaviors or anything like that. So it was kind of hard to look at, but we were able to differentiate on a more challenging balance task of kind of like the differences between um, concussed and, or previously concussed and not concussed. And when we really had the kids that I, like I said, I took out of the study, they kind of confirmed that for me as like a clinician. I was like, this is really cool. Um, but again, it's just taking a task and like making it more um, like sport specific or just demands of like, we have to make quick decisions. Like everything is kind of like a red light, green light. Like you go left or you go right when you're, kind of hit a gap like you have to make those decisions really fast um, and so that anticipatory drive is much more important for sport rather than kind of the like more conservative um, behavior yeah 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 what an interesting <laughs> interesting really complicated. In, no no, no. <laughs> things and like I'm just thinking like if I don't have any equipment but I have nobody that's concussed at the beginning of the season I can just I don't know video them or do some little things with them where I can watch them move and then try it again if they've been concussed and really see like even the eyeball test helps I guess gathering information stuff like that if you don't have like the um the actual equipment um, you shared another article with me that I'm just going to pull up the, um, the schematic from. It was really useful um, for me to sort of follow along, and maybe that'll be the same for other people. So um, you can just sort of, I'll just pull this up. This is, uh, uh, it's right here. Yeah. So this is, this is the uh, other article by Eagle et al. I'll put this up in the discussion on the YouTube channel as well as in the chat box here as soon as I get out of here. But this this is an interesting look at, at concussion as well, right? Where you're looking at some of these like longer term neurophysiological things that are hanging on, um, and this is a this is their theoretical model depicting these relationships between perception and action coupling, which is exactly what you've done with your study um, and what you've talked about a bunch. So um, I don't know if you want to break this down. This is this is a, a it's just a good visual for me to sort of really see um, all the things that are being looked at, right? And that we need to, to definitely look at multitasking and, and, and crossover of systems and these kinds of things. Yeah, so just to kind of break down what perception action coupling is, um, it's like the continuous cyclical relationship between our sensory perception and our action execution or production. So every time we choose to do a movement, there is going to be a subsequent movement that then has to be kind of planned for. Um, so if you, I always think of like canoeing when I'm canoeing, like you do one stroke, it's like, okay, now your body has to prepare for the next stroke. Um, so you have to, and you know, it could change of maybe you switch sides, maybe you um, use different force. Um, so you, you pick up your, your visual vestibular, your proprioceptive information to then kind of calculate your next step. Um, the other piece of that is cognition. And so you can choose what you would do. So if you uh, reach into a cupboard and say you've got um, like five mugs to choose from, right? So you're like, okay, but you don't just grab one and be like, oh, I just took that mug today. It's like you kind of look and you want to choose which one you want. Um, and so those are affordances. So like each mug on that shelf is providing you with an action. So you can grab any of those mugs. Um, another example from that paper, so we talk about uh, affordances, is the action capability. So each individual 
will have different action capabilities. So yeah, you could perceive everything in your world, but you may not be capable of doing everything that your environment provides you. So you save that two basketball players. This is, I'm stealing this from the article, but one is taller than the other. So let's say we got like, you know, Air Jordan and I don't know, I was never good at basketball. So someone was shorter than like five, six. Yeah. Um, playing basketball together, like, like, I don't think of like Danny DeVito or something, <laughs> playing basketball together. Um, and so you've got options. How are you gonna put the ball in the basket? Okay, so of course shooting is always an option, but the taller player probably has the option to slam dunk the ball rather than the other one might have to do a layup because they can't dunk. Sure. So that is all, they're all affordances, but it's to that individual what they're capable of doing. And so that's when we talk about individual cases and context is like, what you're actually doing is that in that person's capability, um, let's like call it their cool box or whatever, like what is actually possible for them to do. And, and that's where, so perception and action, if we can bring together things. So if you have, um, for example, like my paradigm right now, we're looking at the visual acuity, which is just tracking moving targets essentially. Um, so if you combine that with having to maybe make a decision or um, we're having people walk on a treadmill while they're also doing it. So they're having to do multiple things. Um, that's kind of like challenging the, your environment and the task to challenge your perception action coupling. Um, and so they're saying that in that study is that athletes with concussion are at a higher risk for musculoskeletal injuries after returning to play from concussion because there's this disconnect of that perception action coupling. Um, and perhaps they're just not able to take all that information in and then produce the appropriate actions for those scenarios. And you think of like pretty high level athletes at this point, like I always like rugby as an example, because you can make some pretty bad decisions in rugby and get hurt pretty easily. Um, so if, you know, there's just, you're having to perceive so many things, like it's really complicated to try and explain it. Um, when you're thinking about force, you're thinking about your visual variables that you're trying to look at. Um, you know, if you, if you, I always think of when someone's trying to get through defenders and reach their goal, they're going to have to then see the space of what they can fit through, the distance they have to then travel, the speed that they're going, like that is all what our body calculates for us and uses that in our brain. So you can think if there was some kind of either like slow communication or sort of a, just a, a little malfunction in that system that it's going to lead to that. But if we can't, if we don't test for it or and I'm not saying there is a test really for this. There's not really, and this article says that um, we're moving towards this. But if we do treat a concussion similar to an ACL or something, we kind of go through, I always remember in school, like, okay, are we going to put them through 80% of their strength? What is the, what is the clearance point, right? So after a muscle strain, what is your clearance? And so I think we need to establish what is our clearance for athletes and not just like, okay, for hockey, it's like, okay, what about a recreational hockey player? What about a competitive hockey player, amateur, professional hockey player? There is a spectrum. <laughs> People are going to take my course, are going to talk about this too. You're like, oh, we're talking about all these sensory things. And now you're saying there's a spectrum of athletes. Yeah. But it's, it's true. They're going to have all different action capabilities. And that's where it's like, okay, what do you expect? And right now, our testing is kind of putting everyone on the same level which is not the case some people who are more elite are going to look normal because their capacity is up here mm -hmm. meanwhile a younger player and less developed player is going to be lower yeah yeah so that I, to me is like another like and i just that's where i feel like i don't know anything <laughs> yeah yeah well I, I think there's so much to it but and then just the last uh, screen share that i popped up there was basically the conclusion that there's a lot of room for this um mski like these kinds of things um in in the in this realm as as we recover or as athletes are recovering um from concussion uh steve just wrote in a good question um as always uh is there a chance that an athlete may also be in, in your opinion or or in the research whatever you think um is there a chance that an athlete may also be higher risk of mski following concussion due to deconditioning uh, that may happen during concussion recovery and how do you control for this either in research or like 
in life, right? Like, so, so, so for me as a clinician, I'm always, 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 if it's a concussion, like I'm getting them back to body weight work really, really quickly in the gym from a mobility standpoint, not even mobility because it's a bad term, but like from a motion standpoint and then definitely incorporating strength stuff before they're, before they're getting back on the field and like fluid, fluid mechanics of, of the sport. But um, yeah, your take on that, you nodded yes, for sure. Like deconditioning happens. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, and I, I, this one, I, I haven't talked about it yet, but it is really important to me. Um, I think that there can be like a neuromuscular deconditioning to sport, like not having sport exposure. And say we keep people kind of in this box and we tell them not to do anything. And then we're like, okay, hey, you don't have any symptoms anymore. All right, go play. It's like, okay, it's been two months. Um, and then you're throwing them into these like incredibly demanding environments. And that's where I think that we don't spend enough time in the return to play. Once they become asymptomatic, we tend to rely on those symptoms. And once they're gone, we're like, oh, you must be fine. Um, and that's not what we're showing is the case anymore. We're showing that these things linger beyond the um, resolution of symptoms. And that's where we need to be much more diligent and more rigorous with returning to play, depending on like the level that we're looking at and the demands of that person and what they need to do. Um, because yeah, too often I see players spend like a day in stage four and five and then they're just back on Saturday and you're like, yeah, <laughs> you were off for at least two days. weeks before that symptomatic, but for some reason symptomatic and then asymptomatic phase is about this long. And that to me makes no sense. So I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's six, six days between football games. It's like, how do I condense this to make sure that you're eligible to play next weekend? That's a very real problem at, at some higher levels and, and in every level, right? Where, where everybody takes what they're doing to be um, very important, which it is in sport. Like these decisions are massive and they're crucial and they affect different things on different levels. But um, yeah, really good question. Appreciate the questions coming in. Um, really fantastic answer and honest and, and to the point as always. Um, can, can you, uh, um, a question came in, can you mention your course and is it open to everyone? Are you, are you filled up? Are you going to offer it again? And if not, or if so, where, where can you, we find this course? Um, and so as I mentioned at the beginning and a lot of people who have registered, like you have a registration page. I'm like, guys, I made this course in like last month. Um, because people had been asking me about it and I said, yeah, like one day I'll do that. And then the day is now. So, um, there's, I think 30 people already in the course. Um, and it closes tomorrow. <laughs> so um, there isn't a lot of room left in it right now, um, but I will be running it again. Like this is something I've been meaning to do for a long, long time. It's been much more accelerated in developing it in, during COVID um, to be able to offer something right now. And I do plan to do it live in the future. Uh, it is gonna be kind of like this on Zoom with my own exercise. Um, and then we kind of have like an interactive Facebook group. Um, but it is, I did get accredited for CEUs very rapidly, so that was great. I appreciated them so much for doing that for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it is open. I, I do even have like a, she's a strength coach with a MSc in neuroscience. And so I was like, all right, if you want to do this, like you can do it. Um, so a majority, like the first course is all ATs. Um, I am going to be opening it up to like kind of keep it a little more broad. Like I would be fine if it like, I've had OTs message me, I've had physios, I've had, um, I think even just like kinesiologists, other people. And so I'm trying to keep it, uh, like originally I just offered as ATs because that's my main community. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of you in this chat are actually going to be in it. So hopefully you're <laughs> feeling like you're not going to refund your money or something now. But uh, <laughs> um, I think it, it'll just going to be really fun. And it's, it's something I think that will develop, like just like we we're talking about, everything's going to evolve a little bit. And um, yeah, I'm excited to run it and kind of see how things go. But yes, my oh sorry, the name of the course though I should probably say that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've called it the Athlete Brain Series, and so the first course is going to be the Athlete Brain Level One, and it's going to be like kind of an introduction to the concepts we talked about. Like we covered uh, a decent amount of breaking into what we're going to talk about, um, and it's just challenging the ways we've traditionally looked at things and trying to reframe how we evaluate and rehab uh not just concussions like this isn't like some people say i want to learn more about concussion and it's like this isn't based this is based on concussion but 
it's not just applicable to it. Like you were saying, it's applicable to any orthopedic injury. Um, it's kind of how we reframe the way we look at neuromuscular performance. And so I'm ideally going to have like a level two portion. Uh, so I don't just, like I was saying how hard at the time I was having jamming some content in and trying not to make it so crazy overloading. Um, and so I definitely am going to have like more of an advanced uh, level two as well. Awesome. Awesome. I think, uh, again, like coming back to this, uh, this COVID-19 and what this time has allowed us to do is to focus on some really cool opportunities, get creative, uh, network, really showcase, uh, showcase a lot of the connectivity throughout, you know, through our profession as ATs, um, not even just ATs, you know, make this collaborative, make this available, make this accessible. This is the goal of this chat is, is all of these things that you've touched on with your course and, um, and this is it. We have, we have the time and the space and the opportunity to do this and, and forever grateful for, for your time, for everybody's time being here um, and the opportunity with the technology that we have in place now to be able to, to do this. And um, as far as this, this uh, session nine already, uh, uh, speakers are lined up into June now. I just got this, um, uh, our second uh, orthopedic surgeon lined up. Um, so things are like really lining up with this chat platform and, and it's really gaining some momentum for, for us as ATs, um, but for us as, as human beings in a time where I think like this connectedness and normalizing and really accessing uh, really strong, passionate people like yourself, um, this is the goal, this is the target. Um, and with that said, I think like we're, we're coming up against it with the time for sure. Really appreciate your time tonight, Katie. It's been, uh, it's been deeply, deeply rich. I'd love to have you back on again. Maybe we can pair you up with uh, with your old comrade from uh, BC at some point. Um, I tried. Yeah, She's yeah. Busy, right? uh, yeah, <laughs> we can get her off of her busyness and, and hook you guys up on <laughs> the platform. But um, in, in all honesty, th thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Uh, I'll share the articles with everybody. Um, I'll share your course name in the discussion component of the YouTube uh, associated with, with this um, archive once it's posted. Um, everybody else, thank, thank you so much for your time. Your repeated attendance is amazing. Keep spreading the word. Um, keep coming out. And if you have any feedback, again, I'm always open to it. Um, always looking forward to these sessions. And uh, Katie, thank you so much. This has been amazing. This is really, really amazing. Like, I can't even. Uh, thank, thank you, you. so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. time for another hour, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this yeah. has been Let's Chat and Athletic Therapy Roundtable. This is session nine, session 10 coming up Sunday night with Dr. Scott Howitt, uh, doctor of chiropractic. We're going to be talking all things, uh, all things life, COVID, and, uh, and sport health uh, and general wellness related. So look forward to having Scott here as our, our guest on Sunday. Katie, thank you again, everybody else for attending. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording right now. If anybody wants to hang out and just chat a little bit further, um, please feel free. Thank you and good night. <laughs>